My name is Maddie Tag, Seneca Nation Turtle Clan. Um, I am a junior in the Health and Human Services Community Mental Health major, minoring in Indigenous Studies here at UB. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, which is generously sponsored by annual support through Genteel's Excellence in Teaching Fund. This year's keynote speaker is Dr. Sweeney Winchief, Associate Professor, Department of Education at Montana State University. <clears throat> Sweeney Winchief uh, Nakona is a member of the Fort Peck tribes in northern Montana and serves as an associate professor at Montana State University, located in Bozeman. His research interests fall under the umbrella of indigenous intellectualism to include indigenous methodologies in research and indigenous student persistence in higher education. His teaching privileges include critical race theory, indigenous methodologies and research, and law and policy in higher education. As a co-PI of the Sloan Indigenous Graduate Partnership, his service is toward the overall goal of to strengthen and expand university initiatives to recruit, retain, and graduate American Indian and Alaska Native students in STEM masters and doctoral programs. He and his wife, Sarah, have two sons who help keep things in perspective. Welcome, Dr. Sweeney Winchief. Madison, thank you. Uh, I'm going to pull my screen up real quick. We just did a practice run at this, and it worked. Hopefully, it works again. Let's see. All right. Uh, Madison, give me a thumbs up if that, if that works. Can you see the screen right? Okay, perfect. Um, University of Montana, uh, University of Utah, University of Central Oklahoma, and uh, uh, I don't know how to say adult and higher education in Assiniboine, so I'll break into English, but uh, here in a second. But uh, it's good to see everyone. If I were there, I'd take everyone's hand if I could. Um, and I really appreciate the um, being asked to, to be a part of this gathering. So my self-location statement uh, mostly presented through, uh, through the introduction, but uh, I also see it as an important place of positionality. Uh, so that you can see a little bit about my perspective. Um, I've, every institution I've attended has been a predominantly white institution. Um, I had to baby step my way through. Uh, I started at Northwest College in Wyoming because I didn't have good enough grades to uh, compete in NCAA uh, when I was coming out of high school. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, in the summer, uh, I'm thinking a lot about summer right now because uh, there's a lot of snow on the ground here and I'm sure there is in Buffalo as well. Uh, but uh, my summertime is spent easily rafting with my family uh, and or I got a buddy that uh, kidnaps me and makes me go on long motorcycle rides with him every once in a while. Um, earlier, the panel was talking about humanizing and I think we should share with others a little bit uh, and, and be a little bit vulnerable when we uh, speak because it humanizes the process. Um, so I, I understand that, that there are land acknowledgements and I also understand that there's a little bit of controversy that comes around land acknowledgement. And so I encourage my students, uh, and, this, and this is a, a theme that I've, I, I've picked up in the last couple of years, um, to be able to create a relationship with your knowledge. Right, and so I have to humble up and, and say that I have not spent uh, any substantial time um, in, in the area in and around uh, Buffalo, New York, uh, but I do recognize that there are traditional peoples of that place, and I wanna recognize them both in a historical and a contemporary sense of being from that place. I also want to share with you that I'm coming from uh, Bozeman, Montana, which has uh, several uh, connections to several different tribal nations, uh, indigenous nations in the area. 
Um, but to contemporize that and to push on my institution a little bit, my land acknowledgement recognizes that our institution is a land grant institution. Now that's important because the moral act that established land grant institutions uh, happened within about three months of the Intercontinental Railroad, uh, as well as the Dawes Allotment Act, and was a, a larger part of Manifest Destiny. So if you see this picture down here, you see this very angelic figure moving from east to west, and you see lights, and you see progress, and you see trains, and you see uh, power lines, and you see homesteaders, and you see farming, and you see indigenous populations and in both uh, uh, our, our, our animals, uh, indigenous animals to the area, indigenous peoples to the area, and indigenous uh, uh, flora in the area being moved and headed towards the dark. So uh, I'm also not one just to criticize. I, I, I think that if, if you do criticize something, it's important to offer suggestions for improvement. I think that if our institution can change its curriculum from 1893, when it opened under the same auspices, under the uh, Land Grant Act, the, the Moral Act, if, if it can reimagine its curriculum. So uh, the Land Grant Act was about resource extraction, infrastructure development, strengthening militaries, and less British expansion overall. But now at Montana State University and other land grant colleges, uh, and universities, uh, we have American studies, Native American studies, African American studies, we have uh, uh, Latino, Latina, Latinx programs, we have uh, Pacific Islander programs, we have social and behavioral sciences, art, architecture, uh, et cetera. If we can reimagine our curriculum, it's my land acknowledgement that if, 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 if we can reimagine that, we can reimagine our institutions. Uh, relationships with indigenous people. So that being said, uh, it's a little bit weird to do a land acknowledgement while we're online. So I figured I'd, I should do both. Uh, and my, my relationship to a land acknowledgement in Buffalo would be to support these nations that you see on this map and the, the original names of those places to start, um, to develop relationships with those communities solely for developing the relationships not because it's something that we want to research. Um, it's, it's important to check in with those tribes when we speak with them or about them in class to see if what we're saying is in alignment with uh, community ontology. So I started out speaking my language. Um, there's a cultural protocol at place. I asked my relative, I said, hey, every once in a while, I've got to speak to people. I said, is there, is there a way to do that? And they said, yes, yes, speak your language. He, he, my uncle, he said, uh, he said, you don't really know who's sitting in some of those empty chairs or if there's somebody there that, that, that if one of your relatives, you want to acknowledge uh, uh, them in, in our language. Uh, the second one is a land acknowledgement. And I want to add to that, creating a relationship with your, your knowledge and subsequent action. Um, and it's important to recognize the leadership. So all of those that were a part of pulling this together have been in the past. Um, I want to offer my, my heartfelt thanks uh, for that, uh, namely the University at Buffalo, right? We, we work within these institutions and, and I, I, I appreciate the, the work that's being done there specifically around uh, alternative pedagogy and uh, issues of social justice. Uh, educational social justice specifically. Um, I want to thank the University Advisory Council on Race, uh, the Office of Curriculum Assessment and Teaching. Um, I want to thank Madison for the gracious introduction and Daniel Kelly for the invitation uh, and the, the uh, Density of Excellence in Teaching Conference. So my heartfelt uh, for uh, my heartfelt thank you for, for that invitation. All right, so I want to start this out with a question. Uh, my question for you is, why do you do what you do? And I want you to think about this in terms of your community, plural, right? I want you to think about this in terms of um, aligning answers, uh, how you might respond to both the leadership of the institution 
uh, whatever institution you're at, the uh, communities that you come from, the people that you went to elementary school with, um, your aunties, your uncles, your parents, your kids, et cetera. Uh, being able to, and, and, and I'm not looking for a knee-jerk reaction or a response to a rhetorical question, maybe uh, one to think about. Um, in preparing for this, I, I had to do a little bit of thinking about this as well. And I, I, I share a lot of uh, what I'm going to share is going to be shared in story. So you, if you ask me at the end of this presentation, why do you do what you do? Um, I was in my own doctoral program at the University of Utah. I just got done with comprehensive examinations, uh, comp, comp exams. And upon completing those, I really felt like I was a part of like the, I was becoming assimilated. I was, uh, uh, it was, it was, um, it, it was changing my place on my own identity continuum in relationship to the Assiniboine nation on Fort Peck. Fort Belknap in Canada, et cetera. Um, and I took a month and I just read Indigenous scholars to see how they navigated their identity as they navigated higher education. What was happening? How did they use their identity in their work? Did they use their identity in their work? After comprehensive exams, I almost I almost split off the off the radar, and, and that, that's a, a high point of assistance for all doctoral students. Uh, at that point, um, I, I, one of the readings I, I had was from Manulani uh, Meyer. Manulani Aluli Meyer is a Kanaka Maoli scholar, a Native Hawaiian scholar. And she said something really important, and, and, and I could still feel those, those words jump off the page, right, and, and, and get into my head. They're still there. And she literally writes in a way that's abstract enough that you can, you can, Take your own meaning and to provide space for that. And the way that I read that, the words that you said were, how you move through the space that you're in tells us a lot about you. And so I thought about that from a community perspective. What would my grandparents, who were no longer uh, around, um, what would they think of this? Do they want me to be successful? Would they see me? Would they see this assimilation thing that's happening as a result of higher education? Um, what about my own dad who had, had passed? And what, what does he think of this? Is he proud? Is he worried? Is he, um, and, and, and what about oncoming generations and the maintenance of cultural identity as we navigate uh, predominantly white institutional space? So uh, in, in, it, it, it sort of happened for me that the week after I defended my dissertation, I, uh, uh, we went to a conference and we were presenting at an anthropologist conference in Honolulu, Hawaii. It was a, but there was one specific interest group that was about indigenous, uh, uh, indigenous anthropology and reclaiming uh, indigenous anthropology. And my uh, co-author, my, my uh, co-presenter and I, we spent all of our time using all of our big words, ontology, epistemology, pedagogy, uh, hermeneutics, right? Uh, we were using all the, the, the vernacular of, of the academy. And there was an all indigenous audience. And when it was time for questions, before we, as we finished, we kind of gave each other that look like we knocked it out of the park and we were mentally high-fiving. Here, there was this, this one of the questions, this, this older gentleman, in that context, I would call him an uncle. Uh, older gentleman, he was from Tonga, and big blue and white hibiscus shirt, big fella, big bushy salt and pepper hair. He raised his hand and he said, yes, sir, please. And he said, you boys, he said. He said, theory, blah, 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 he said. Um, he said, I want to know what you're doing for your communities right now. And the reason that I do what I do is because I never want to be caught flat-footed again like that um, from, uh, from an Indigenous community. So it helped me reframe like the, the importance of being able to communicate with our, our research and our teaching and uh, meeting people where they're at in order to forward important ideas 
uh, that are hopefully of community benefit. Um, all right, so I, I learned this concept uh, PSA just to, just to outline what we're doing uh, or what I'm what I'm presenting here, and I see there's a there's an issue or or a problem. And my problem statement would be that institutional efforts toward access focus on the plumbing while sometimes forgetting about the water, right? And so our institutions have some infrastructure uh, that that is um, the very purpose of that infrastructure is to provide access for uh, institutionally marginalized communities. So if we think about the structure as the plumbing, we have to remember that the people are the water, right? We have to think, of, think about the people and focus on the people um, as much, if not more, as the, as the plumbing, because the water is the important part. That's the reason that we do it. Um, I think solutions to that are addressing uh, barriers like uh, what my friend Steve Abbott calls the crisis of relevance, right? My K-20 experience very rarely was I, uh, what was the curriculum relevant to me? I got to learn about somebody else's history for the most part. I got to learn about others' uh, ways of doing everything, math, uh, science, social sciences, humanities, arts, etc. Very little, if any, was there, was there something that was designed that aligned with my identity as an indigenous person? Um, there's that pedagogical distancing that happens as a result. And as a further result, this concept of epistemicide. If I were gonna pick a word of the day, uh, my word of the day is epistemicide. This was introduced to me by a, an indigenous Mongolian student in one of my classes and, and since that time, um, I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this ending of knowledge systems and how problematic it can be. Not only can it be problematic for uh, society as a whole, uh, but also uh, problematic in providing access for those students that can make a difference because they, their heart is in those communities. And then as far as action goes, participate. Contribute. And this isn't just an, an instructions for everyone. This is for myself. Right, this is my, for myself as well. Uh, you've got to make work relevant. The, the institution and the current curriculum may not do that for you. And then finally, there's a practice piece of this, right? Think about actions, get them on a calendar, give them the time that they need. So there's a couple of caveats. Uh, I started with indigenous story work. Uh, this, this comes from Joanne Archibald's work. Um, and so story work is a, is a really beautiful thing. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, a big one for me is my cultural accountability. How can I be accountability to what's expected in the academy, either as a student, as an instructor, uh, professor, as a researcher, et cetera, um, but also uh, the caveat of uh, many ways of knowing. Or I, if, if, if we want to get academic about it, we can call it epistemological pluralism. So the, the crisis of relevance, I see as, as, as um, for me, what helped is uh, Joanne Archibald's indigenous story work. She outlines a lot of different stories, specific from a, a couple of communities in the Pacific Northwest specifically, and she delineates them, right? There are sort of community uh, uh, legend stories that teach uh, social interaction, that teach uh, they, there's a lot of trickster stories out there, coyote stories, ikkomi stories. There's, a, there's multiple pictures out there, and the and the role of those stories are to teach us what not to do. Um, in 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 ways that that works in the academy is if there is a someone in your your professional context is giving you a hard time, I've come to reframe them in my own mind that they might be ikkomi. They might be that powerful picture that teases us, makes a fool of us, uh, sometimes makes a fool of themselves. Uh, they, they give us a hard time. Uh, there are stories that are specifically, uh, they're, they're mandated to be told word for word correctly through history. Uh, there are stories that are personal experience or anecdotal. Uh, multiple other kinds of stories. It does a really great job of delineating these kinds of stories. 
and the utility that they have in scholarship. Uh, the second one, this idea of pedagogical distancing. I'm curious about, I was, I, I still am curious about how students experience learning. I don't wanna think of myself as a teacher so much as a facilitator of learning. And I wanna make sure that uh, you know, I understand that some students' uh, uh, way of learning might be different than my own. So I wanna give them agency in, in that. Um, and then part of the root of this is in epistemicide. So when I was in the fourth grade, no, 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 no. I was in the seventh grade and we were in a history class. And as I was in this history class, they were teaching about uh, uh, Native Americans in this Wyoming history book. And what they were telling me about uh, Native Americans in history was absolutely counter to what I learned from my own grandparents, from my own community. And what that did for me was uh, created huge distrust. If this teacher is lying to me, what's to say, who's, how do I know that every teacher that I have isn't lying to me? Uh, coincidentally, I ended up going to the psychologist a bunch that, from that year. Um, I was really frustrated. My parents uh, valued education. Uh, so much so that if you go to 225 Bodine Avenue in Evanston, Wyoming right now, uh, about a foot above the, the door, at the bottom of the front door, there's a dent where my dad threw his lunchbox after he saw my report card. It wasn't because uh, I, I, I didn't have the capacity. It was because I didn't trust my teachers. I didn't trust what I was learning because they were lying to me about how I understood who we were as indigenous people. So these are things that I, these are, this is why I do what I do, um, to address these crises of relevance, to close the gap in pedagogical distancing and to address epistemicide. Uh, let's see. All right, so I used to be a huge critic of the term cultural competence. I see, I, I thought time cultural competence as um, sort of a very Western way of doing things, a very um, rugged individualist sort of Indiana Jones, right? This professor gets to go to the, these communities that are in disarray and communities of color around the world and automatically just because he says something, it's taken as, uh, it, it's taken as the truth and then he finds the rocks and, and saves the black and brown people. Um, so I, I've just uh, uh, developed uh, my understanding is that this concept of cultural competence is a stepping stone to what now some scholars are calling cultural humility, right? And I've really, really latched on to this concept of cultural humility. Uh, it surfaced a lot in my own research around mentoring indigenous students. Um, it's circular in nature. It, it, it creates room for uh, continuous development and lifelong learning. There's a capacity for cultural humbleness. Um, your, your researchers and people that teach are conscious of the contributions of the communities that they're engaged with. Um, they understand that some knowledge is not appropriate for institutionalization, right? Community held knowledge that's protected by language. Uh, it values community distinction, right? It recognizes that being indigenous, uh, American Indian, uh, Seneca uh, and, and, your, and your intersectionality is not a monolithic experience. So I often feel like, and, and I think spotlighting uh, was, was, was brought up uh, in the previous session where uh, students are often asked to speak on behalf of their whole community, all the people that ever lived are now living or ever will live. And uh, that, that's just not the case, right? It doesn't make room for uh, individual identity in, 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 in community continual. So I want to take that one step further, right? I, I, I have to have to honor a lot of folks in, the, in public health and nursing are engaged in cultural humility work. And I have one issue. I mean, if, if, 
if you're an academic, you're, you're literally paid to overthink things sometimes. And I see that in my own overthinking of cultural humility is that one of the, one of the issues is that cultural humility often relieves allies of their work. They can literally go to a meeting and just say, I want to hear from the community and not contribute when they have something important to contribute. Um, and, and, it's, and it's certainly contextual. So what I'm showing here is an academic poster. I uh, presented this academic poster at, uh, uh, an, acad at an academic conference. Right? My, my co-author, uh, Dr. Jason Cummins, is He's from the Abzaliga Nation or the Crow Nation here in Montana. Uh, and myself got to thinking about how can we share our scholarship with our own communities in ways that make sense. And we thought about indigenous story work. So I'm going to walk everybody through this. There's, there's, there's two stories to everything on here. This is a growing living document. In fact, wait a minute. I got the real one right here. So. This is, uh, there's a lot going on here. This is traditionally uh, tanned, brain tanned, uh, deer skin, they call it buck skin. And there's another uh, project that I did related to sort of the STEM side of that. Uh, we could talk uh, more about that if we have some time, but it's about uh, Manulani Meyer holographic epistemologies or uh, because it native common sense. But we took the scholarship a little bit further and developed this concept of epistemological pluralism. Uh, this is a winter count methodology and a long time ago, uh, our communities here in the plains and prairie regions, excuse me, uh, uh, this is how they kept track of, of history. This was, these were oral histories, but there were uh, images where at after the first snow, the elders would get together and they would decide on what the most important uh, the, the most important event was of that year. And if you go to the Smithsonian, they have several different winter counts and they've, they've triangulated that they can tell that there's so many winter counts that had a similar image, they had similar images in similar places. And one was a bunch of stars, shooting stars. And, they, and, and astrophysicists figured out that Yes, during that year, during this particular time, you would have seen a, a, a fantastic meteor shower. And so they were able to locate the year in, in, uh, in, a, uh, in, in, in a scientific way. And so those, those, those winter counts, there was a keeper of these winter counts. And it was their job to paint on those hides the picture of what, uh, what the elders decided was most important. And they would paint it on that hide, and that they would they would tell as they told the story. And these would just go on and on. They're often circular, and so they would have one uh, winter count rolled up, and they would have to open another one to start start telling the next stories. And that's how they tell history. So this one right here is a little more contemporary, a little more modern. But this space up here in the left hand corner, that's going to intentionally be left blank. That that stands for the exclusion and erasure of our, of our indigenous people in curriculum, in teaching, in pedagogy, in research. Um, we, we, we have to look really hard to find ourselves, right? So this space up here, if we were gonna paint anything, it would probably be one of those like circles with a line through it, right? You're not there. Now that exclusion and erasure uh, uh, can be seen in uh, uh, policy, it, it can be seen in our, in our curriculums, et cetera. And then the next stage is sort of the problematic inclusion stage. Now this is a picture right here of a, big, of a cowboy hat, of a big hat. And the story behind that one is, uh, I was on a grant uh, in computer science and the CI of the grant, we were developing uh, culturally responsive uh, coding or computer science curriculum for middle schoolers. And they pulled out this beaded bag, a picture of a beaded bag, and they said, okay, we want to recreate this, this picture. And there was a man on a horse, had a war bonnet on, uh, and there was a teepee and a young woman or a woman next to that teepee. And she said, okay, if I'm talking to seventh graders, I'm going to want to know, like, what's going on in this story? Tell me about this story. 
She said, what's this, what, what's with this guy in the big hat? He must be important. And I thought, oh my God, big hat. That's, that's, if, if I'm in seventh grade and the teacher said that to me, I would run the other direction. I almost ran the other direction anyway. Um, and so that, that stands for problematic inclusion. And a lot of times our institutions um, espouse values of diversity, equity, justice, in some cases, anti-racism. Um, but the way that it is done is, is, is problematic and can be received as a uh, racial microaggression, right? So that's this, each one of these images has a literature review behind it. I'm gonna move to this next one. Uh, this one stands for the academic term would be theoretical sensitivity. In short, theoretical sensitivity is what you can Google Scholar, right? So anybody here, if we give you about a week and some pizza uh, and eight hours a day, you could pick almost anything and see and, and, and synthesize the literature around it to learn something about it. And that's not all bad, but theoretical sensitivity is not centered in community. Oftentimes the people that review those journals uh, don't have any sort of community connection and are operating by a standard that is uh, exclusive of community, though it is a social construction of knowledge. All right, so we, the, the reason that this is a stance is in 19, in the mid 90s, I think the mid 90s, there was a, my, my mom was a letter carrier and she came home one day and they had this, a, this stance series called the War Bonnet series, and, or the, the headdress series. And one of them was our, 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 our tribe, Assiniboine. And my mom, who's uh, uh, Anglo, comes home and she hands this book of stamps to my dad and, and she says, hey, congratulations, you guys got your own stamp. My dad kind of looked at it and laughed and set it down. And then my mom says, shouldn't that be called the War Bonnet series? Because every time we do something with these when we're back at Fort Peck, um, they, 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 they refer to a headdress as something else. This is a war bonnet. My dad said, yeah, yeah, I suppose so. So that moves us over to this concept here. And this is, this is our picture of a war bonnet. So to review, we've got exclusion and eraser up here. We've got problematic inclusion. We've got, uh, we've got theoretical sensitivity. And over here, we've got what Dolores Delgado Bernal, uh, a Latina scholar, uh, that talks about cultural intuition. This is information that you can't Google scholar, right? This is information that's shared. In her case, she does testimonials uh, with uh, Latinas and Chicanas, and they talk about uh, a lot about Carayoso's community cultural wealth, um, the kinds of things that you learn while you're cooking together. And so that brings us to this concept of the war bonnet, right? Uh, and this is a, a literal painting of my co-author's family's war bonnet. Um, and, and in order to understand who wears these and why, when they can wear them, and no, it's not at the South by Southwest uh, concert, it's not at any musical festivals, these, these things carry meaning in our community, right? Um, and, 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 and in order to learn something about them, it requires contribution to the community. And so that, that's, that's our space of cultural intuition. Now, uh, cultural intuition is also a little bit problematic. Like I hypothesize, why is the translation war bonnet? And my theory, or I guess my hypothesis is that when you had westward expansion coming, people were coming across and running to running into indigenous peoples out here, they, uh, they started calling them war bonnets because it was an act of demasculating men, right? And that act was who wears bonnets in those days, who wore bonnets, right? Women and babies. And so the English term doesn't really uh, give, uh, give meaning to these in the way that, that, that they should be. So that's the, one of the limitations of cultural intuition is that it's often uh, presented in Spanish, or I mean, it's often presented in English and in other languages, I suppose, other colonial languages. All right, so we move from cultural intuition to what we're calling indigenous knowledge traditions. 
right? Indigenous knowledge, uh, deep knowledge, uh, as it were. And this is knowledge that I can't share, right, with you. Or the article that we created, uh, that we developed as a result of this project, um, we were active about sharing that this is information that's not to be uh, not to be shared outside of our community context. That transmission of that knowledge is dependent on relationship, because once you give that knowledge to somebody, it comes with it's like Spider Man, like with knowledge comes great responsibility, right? Uh, you're you're responsible for perhaps helping carry that knowledge or carrying that knowledge for your community. Um, a lot of people ask what these images are down here. These images, this image down here, that's a buffalo track, and that's present representative of my name that I introduced myself in my native language uh, at the beginning, and my colleague Jason Cummins' uh, uh, name given by his community. Uh, uh, that's that's so essentially those are just our our signatures. Um, this is a great project uh, for being able to yes present it in an academic forum, but also be able to take it back home, share with your relatives, teach your kids these really complicated, complex ideas related to pedagogy, uh, related to research uh, in predominantly white institutions and academic space, uh, as well as being able to uh, articulate and, and, and bridge that gap back and forth. So my advice, or I guess my suggestion for researchers, instructors, professors, scholars, et cetera, is to, excuse me, at, at least start at theoretical sensitivity, right? Start with this, with this concept and do a little bit of research around it. Yes, dig around, see what, see what people are saying about it, but know that there's a knowledge that comes in relationship. There's knowledge that comes from community contribution uh, that brings a reality to the theoretical sensitivity and that cultural intuition. I do caution scholars, um, I, I, I want to, I, I caution scholars to avoid creating relationships in order to do the research, right? Doing research should begin with the community, not uh, it can begin as a result of the relationship. If the community accepts you, knows what your strengths are, knows what you do, uh, and finds a place that you can contribute to community, that's where research questions should begin. Not something that we read about in the literature that's missing and we can fill that gap. So that, that to me adds to that concept of uh, bicultural accountability and moves us from cultural humility to cultural humanity, right? Being able to locate ourselves on this continuum is important and, and it doesn't have to be in this format. Like if you were to, if these were all, if this was, if I was to put myself in this uh, framework as a computer science, if the topic was computer science, I am at best problematic inclusion, right? My kids, one in junior high, one in high school, can both code better than I can. Um, and so this at least provides capacity for a place, a realistic place of knowing and contribution while removing the shame. I think a lot of people are, uh, for lack of a better term, frozen by cultural humility. Like maybe it's not my place to speak. I, may, I might not have anything to offer, but you might, you, you, you do have something to offer. Just recognize like that you're, you're also learning and contributing from one of these spaces. All right, so if we talk about cultural competency, this is uh, the Western rugged, rugged individualism. I'm now seeing it as a stepping stone, but in terms of pedagogy, this would be an instructor saying, this is my class. If we move to cultural humility, um, we're being awakened to our privilege. Uh, we're developing empathy uh, but maybe stepping back and telling students, this is your class, right? You decide. Um, and then if we move to cultural humanity, this is a focus on uh, interdependence uh, and synergy. This, this is a uh, in contrast or maybe in concert with uh, independence and your own contribution, but recognizing it as, as the collective. All right. So examples of cultural humanity. Uh, 
one would be the, the uh, indigenous ways of knowing in the engineering classroom. Uh, we're developing curriculum for uh, post-secondary uh, engineering, right? So Montana has a law, it's called the Indian Education for All Act, uh, mandated in 19, uh, state constitution mandate in 1972. And the spirit of that law is that all curriculum, K-20, at public institutions include the most, the, the local indigenous communities uh, uh, in all curricula. And so I was presenting this to some engineers. I'll, I'll show you an example here in a second. And a couple of them really grasped this. They saw that this is something that they should do, right? This is something that they're legally bound to do. Um, we also want to think about cultural humanity in terms of holographic epistemology. Uh, this is Manu Lani Meyer's work. Uh, Manu talks about holographic epistemologies as being uh, uh, three dimensional, right? A hologram. And each piece of, 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 of whatever happens happens together. And that, uh, in her words, uh, mental, physical, and spiritual, right? As opposed to, like, yeah, I would say that we do pretty good on the mental front, right? We line up in rows and, and, and we engage mentally. But we have to change clothes and go to a whole different class to get the physical part. And then the spiritual part, people are scared of. We can't approach that because it separates a certain state. In her mind, these things move together. And my example, my way of understanding this is that if you speak English, if you're literate in English, if you can read English, uh, chances are the reason you can read that is because when you were young, your, your kindergarten teacher, your, your primary school teachers um, led you through an exercise in holographic epistemology. And that, everybody here is literate because they sang the ABCs and they sang them together. So you have the, the, the mental component where we have uh, 26 different unique characters that have different sounds and rules in putting them together. And that, that would be like the, the, the mental component. The physical component would be the act of singing them, right? And the spiritual component, component is that we sing them together. We sing them with other human beings. We, we, we joined together in song. And that would be an example of holographic epistemology. Uh, in research, we also, uh, uh, one of, uh, the students that I work with, future Dr. Uh, Twyla Miner, um, she did a tribal critical race theory analysis of the financial aid process, right? These are things that people often don't apply uh, critical theories to. It's usually couched in business or ethics or, or, or something of the like, but to use tribal critical race theory as a framework for evaluating and assessing uh, and offering suggestions on how financial aid is connected to tribal sovereignty and uh, the, the, the problematic limitations of the current financial aid as it works at our institution. Now, in teaching, I had a student uh, one time, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll walk through the development of uh, co-constructing our syllabus, but uh, essentially the, 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 the short version is I reserve 50% of the, uh, the points, right? And that's an initial reflection and a final reflection for 5% each. The, and, and the initial reflection is responding to the learning objectives without Googling, without Wikipedia, without doing any research, without reading the textbook, just to get a baseline, right? The final reflection, the, uh, uh, another 5% of the grade, is the exact same question to see how students grew as a result of the class. Uh, I reserve points for participation and attendance, and I reserve points for a uh, final paper and a presentation, and that's it. The other 50% of the points go to the class. And in this one particular class, it was a student development theory class, I had a student come up and the, 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 the class came to consensus on one of the assignments they wanna do, is provide an outward facing internet platform showing the world how they met the learning objective. And so the student comes up afterwards and he says, hey, can I, can I do mine on Pinterest? 
And at first I was, I was like, I, I, I literally took my head no and said yes, because I thought that it was going to be all about sweaters and cupcakes and stuff. That certainly wasn't the case, right? She, uh, she was, she had it all delineated. She had pictures of the theorists themselves, descriptions of the theories, application of the theories. She had uh, a really great Pinterest page. And there were students from all over the country who were Googling the theorists for their work and trying to find uh, trying to find information that they would use in their own classes. And they were going to her page. She started this, this national level conversation through Pinterest. Um, so that, that's something where students had agency to choose what they wanted to do. And it turned out to be a, a super beneficial. In another class in, in indigenous research and methodologies, a huge piece of indigenous research is stating your positionality. Uh, people that are into quantitative methods, a good way to, to think about positionality is a revelation of bias. Um, in quantitative methodologies, it's, it's merely sharing your perspective or how you see things the way you do or why you see them the way you do. <laughs> Given your own experiences uh, and, and your, not, your, your own knowledge set. And so rather than just state our positionalities, the class decided that the positionalities assignment should be a giveaway or a gift exchange for, for lack of a better term. And they had to make something, create something, give something to a classmate and share with that classmate who they were. And it's one of the most powerful exercises that I've ever experienced in a class. Um, there, was a, 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 there, were, there were tears in that class because it was a humanizing process and they were allowed to show people without judgment who they were uh, which opened doors to communication between students and myself, opened doors to uh, understanding multiple perspectives. It was, it was awesome. Um, the last example of cultural humanity would be from, uh, I, I teach a law and policy course, and we developed a practice, the students developed a practice assignment. They wanted real world action. Right, as a result of the work that they did in class. And one semester, uh, a couple of years ago, there was a state bill that was, um, it was, it was about open carry firearms, right? So if you were a student, uh, if you were a citizen, uh, if you owned a firearm, you could wear the thing on your hip, you could carry it to class. And, and, and the class decided, well, why are they making these decisions? And so each student took it upon themselves to uh, develop a contribution to a grander paper, a larger uh, white paper that we submitted during the public comment uh, session of, uh, of the house bill. And hopefully, hopefully it, it made a difference. Um, we had uh, uh, an executive summary up front, right? If you've only got time for a little bit, these are the, 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 the points that we're worried about. And then the white paper itself substantiated with data uh, in comparison to peer institutions, in, in comparison to other states and public institutions in those states and the reasons that they do what they do. And, and, and hopefully it had a little more traction than somebody that's just uh, going in without substantiating their perspective. And then the other one was a building here on campus. We were talking about institutional liability. And there was a building here on campus and you could literally see where the icicles would fall and you could see tracks go by where these big six foot icicles were falling. And I took my class on a, on a, on a field trip. It was only about 120 feet, but we went over and took pictures of this building, took pictures of students and faculty and society uh, going right where these icicles were falling. And since then, if we left my office and I walked out with my computer, I can tell you that they have a, a, a temporary metal barrier that goes up around this building. So there was some practice there and students uh, were humanized right, by being able to influence the world around them through course assignment. All right, one place that this comes in into scholarship, mentorship, et cetera, I, I recognize that uh, previously uh, uh, the uh, panelists were talking about mentoring. We've reframed mentoring. 
and and and, and in the development of indigenous and indigenous mentoring programs specifically for indigenous students in STEM was training their faculty to re-examine how they mentor. And one of the caveats, one of the foundations of this, this project is, is based on Iris Heavy Runner's family education model and some of Jim Stanley's work. Um, so I want everybody to think of their academic mentoring, how they experienced it, right? And I'm going to guess that it was sort of a hierarchical, sort of top down, one primary advisor or mentor. Uh, certainly the case in STEM. Sometimes, sometimes that's a, a postdoc uh, doing that work. Um, but we wanted to re examine mentoring using traditional kinship structures. So I now want you to think of your own family, whatever family you come from. And okay, you're in, 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 and I'm just speaking within a, a Cinnaboyne or Nakota context. Your mom is your mom, but so are her sisters. Literally, the word is inana, it's my mom life. So your mom and her sisters, you have your mom, if she's not there, something happens and she's unable to be a mom. That responsibility falls to her sisters. They become your mom life. And the same works to your dad. Your dad is your dad, and your dad's brothers, they're not your uncles, they're your dad like, right? Like my dad, Atena, dad like. All right. Now, your, so your, their, their kids, your mom likes and dad likes kids are your siblings. But your mom's brothers are your teasing uncles. It's their responsibility to tease you, to, to, when you're little, their job is to tease you until you cry and then tease you for crying. And I thought this was, I, I thought that this ended when you grew up and had a family and, and had kids and, and but, they, but it never ends, they continue to tease. It's a, it's a lifelong appointment. Their other role, their other role is to know your accomplishments and brag for you. So you don't have to brag for yourself, right? So you don't speak highly of yourself. Uh, that's, that's not seen as a, a necessarily socially acceptable in, in traditional communities. Now, your mom's brothers, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, your mom's brothers are your teasing uncles. Your dad's sisters are the disciplinarians, right? And they have absolute discretion. Uh, it can be a really good or a bad experience, doesn't matter, it's up to them. And what that does, their job is to chase you back to your parents. Right? If you do something wrong, your parents, it's not their responsibility to get after you for it or discipline you for it. Rather, they know what happened. They're gonna go talk to your auntie. They're gonna say, hey, Charlotte, uh, Sweeney's being a, a goofball again. He did this, he did that. Can you take care of it? Um, thank God, Auntie Charlotte, she'd rather buy ice cream and talk about it. She never got rough with me, but. Uh, that 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 was the the societal roles of those folks. Now their kids are your cousins. Your uncles and aunties' kids are your cousins, but your mom likes and dad likes kids are your siblings. So that's a little bit about the traditional fabric in Cinnaboyne kinship structure. I explain that to our mentors because different tribes have different ways. I know that the Abzalaga, the Crow, they have a different uh, kinship system. Uh, the Dakota have a different kinship system. The Black Feet have a different kinship system. The idea is to open that up. But for me, I make I turn this into an academic endeavor. Again, we, we get paid to overthink things. So here's me, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, much more fit than I am now. Um, but these are my academic relatives. And so generationally, these would be, and I don't think they would appreciate being called my academic grandparents, um, but there's a theme in that if I'm, if I'm using the term within a community context. I have uh, my committee chairs, committee chair was Danny Solorzano at UCLA, uh, Lat Crit uh, scholar, uh, Dwayne Champagne is in my lineage, another uh, indigenous scholar at uh, UCLA. Uh, I mentioned Manulani uh, Aluli Meyer, uh, she uh, was, was 
influential, uh, so influential that her writing kept me in college. Um, my committee chair, uh, Dr. Via Pondo, uh, Dr. Calderon, who's now at Western Washington, and Jim Stanley, who was tribal college president at Fort Peck Community College. And these are my academic siblings, brothers, uh, sometimes cousins, sometimes uh, sometimes family, depending on who they're, uh, who they're, who's on their committee and what role they served. And now there's another generation, right? So I've got students and I hope to provide the same sort of foundation or at least a foundation that works for them in the way that they make sense of their, their academic experience, right? The problem with a top-down one advisor, one committee chair mentorship is that the same person who could be who might be funding your education is also the most critical of your scholarship. And that can be incredibly frustrating for students who aren't used to having someone assume all of those roles. It creates more work for the committee chair themselves. Um, if I have students and I want to get after one of them, I talk to one of my colleagues. Hey, would you do me a huge favor? Julian is being a goofball. Can you please go talk to him and tell him that he needs to use APA seventh edition uh, citing um, and reference. He needs to uh, uh, he, he needs to work on his more than three sentences in uh, uh, at least more than two sentences in a paragraph, whatever the case may be. So to use the community uh, and to think about academic lineage uh, in concert with how you make sense of the world or how our students make sense of the world. All right, so there is some academic and professional utility in this. Uh, I'll start with theoretical, right? Uh, if you understand your academic family, you know who your committee chair is, uh, who their academic siblings and who their academic elders are, uh, chances are you can work with them on the same theories. Bumping down to methods, you can work down to, I teach critical race theory. I don't claim to be a critical race theorist, uh, but I, I, I do use the theory and many of my academic relatives use the same theory and in particular counter storytelling. Uh, there's a, a, a practical uh, or a pragmatic uh, utility or advantage to this in that there's community centeredness. Right? All of my academic family in some way, shape, or form are contributing to uh, their, their home communities and to understand it relationally. So oftentimes, with, uh, uh, in, in, we're in an academic forum, so I'll use the term Latin X. Um, uh, I would use different terminology in community, but uh, there's a relational component. When I talk to uh, uh, Latin X scholars, I, I describe the system and they really appreciate it, really appreciate it, and they talk about the concept of familia, right? And and how to and start making sense out of it in terms of their understanding of familia and academic familia. Uh, there's also some fun that we have. I I, I remind my Latin X scholar relatives that the Spanish language that they're speaking, so intertwined with their identity, is the language of the conquistador. And I, I like to trouble that out a little bit. I see it as my responsibility as their indigenous relative. So if we uh, talk about constructing this in the class, right? This is, uh, this is related to Bloom's taxonomy, but I asked students at the very beginning of class, think about something that you have learned and share with us how you learned it. So if you think to yourself, what's something that you learned in a class and it was one of those things that was really easy to pick up. Um, and not, not even easy to pick up. I think the best uh, learning facilitators can take really, really heavy things and not only get you to pick them up, but make it so that you want to, right? And so as people think about this, we start thinking about, okay, how well do you know this thing? on Bloom's taxonomy. Are you in that sort of graduate level space where you're using what you've learned to analyze, evaluate, uh, and be creative with? Uh, uh, I, I believe it was uh, 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 Dr. Uh, McFadden, McFadden uh, that talked about 
moving from being consumers to producers. That's what happens when we move up Bloom's taxonomy, right? That's, that, that's something that we want our graduate students to do. So as they're thinking about that, I implement this, uh, it's called the ILIS, Indigenous Leaders Interactive System, and it's an adjusted version, right? I take the learning outcomes from the course and I put them on the screen. And then I ask the students at the end of the semester, how are we gonna prove that we've met these learning objectives, right? Now, now the, the, the goal here is to not silence anyone, to get contributions uh, from everyone. So everybody contributes an assignment suggestion and, and invariably it starts out with things that they've done in other classes. Right, well, maybe we could have a weekly reading and a discussion, or maybe we could have, uh, we could break it up into a uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, like a lit review that would go toward our final paper. Um, and then we get some really unique ones, like I just talked about, the positionality uh, giveaway, the, uh, the online platform through Pinterest, uh, et cetera. Now, during this time, you go around individually and ask each person, and we always go uh, clockwise, the way that Earth moves around the sun, and ask students, and you contribute. Now, the, you, other students can ask questions for clarification, but it's certainly not the time for critique, right? We don't want to silence anybody's voice in this. We want all good ideas on the board. And keep in mind, this is 50% of the course that they're, they're developing here. And so after we go through that, they go through two times typically in order. And we used to go until exhaustion, right? Until nobody had any answers left. Um, but then we had to develop a, a capacity for students who are just not able to, not, not able to push any harder or not able to think of anything else and allow them to pass. We then cluster ideas uh, based on uh, suggested assignments that could be uh, uh, gathered together and made the same assignment, the students get a certain number of votes. Say there's, there's uh, 20 students in the classroom, everybody gets five votes, 25%. And they half mark next to the assignments that they think are most important. After we're done voting, we rank those. Those become our assignments. We connect those assignments to the learning objectives make sure we got all our learning objectives uh, met, and then assign pedagogical value. Right? We, the students assign how many points each one of those assign, uh, uh, assignments is gonna be worth. Um, so that's how we co-construct that class. And some really beautiful things have, have come as a result. What we're doing here is inviting students to become invested in their own learning in, in the class. Right? This is that strength-based approach. Students uh, choose assignments that already build upon strengths that they have. They're comfortable with it. It removes a certain amount of uh, imposter syndrome. And again, uh, like mentioned previously, we're, we're developing our students to become, or, or to recognize themselves as moving from being consumers to providers of knowledge and information. Uh, it, it, provides room for community cultural wealth as defined by Yoso. And at least it's starting students out in that place of theoretical sensitivity or the, the, the posted stamp. All right, when we talk about, I, I, I don't have a clock. Um, Daniel, is there, where are we at on time? Uh, you have a, a, a little bit longer, and then we're going to go to questions, if that's okay. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, so bicultural accountability, in, at least in terms of research. Uh, this is Dr. Kenneth Ryan. Um, I, I, did, I wrote a manuscript, uh, and I before hitting submit, I just about sent it. I thought, I better check in with like some community folks to see if, to see if this is something that, uh, that I want to share. And this was, this was uh, um, about academic knowledge production, uh, the, the intersection of indigenous uh, realities and academic knowledge production. And so before I sent it, I, I, I shot it to my uncle and I said, hey, check this out. Uh, he's got an honorary doctorate from the University of Montana. Uh, he is a traditional knowledge keeper. He's 
speak fluently the Assiniboine language, the Nakona language. Uh, he has worked in DC. Uh, he knows genealogy. Uh, he knows, he knew exactly who I was and he knows, uh, he might know who you are. He's just a fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, uncle. And so I thought this to him and I right, called him and I said, hey, I'm writing a piece and I, I want you to check it out just to, just to make sure I'm doing things right. And he said, okay, he said, he said, but don't email me. He said, send it in a brown envelope, brown paper envelope. And I don't know why, it's not my place to ask. I didn't know if he was concerned about surveillance. I didn't know if he was just a tactile person and had like some of us had to have uh, paper to, to, to feel and write on. And, and, and I thought when I sent it to him, I, I mailed it to him, I said, oh man, I didn't think I was gonna get it back for six months or a year. So I just kind of forgot about it. Six days later, this thing shows up in my mailbox and I, and I got it and it landed. And I don't know if he had track, a tracking on it or whatever, but before I opened it, he called me and he said, did you get it? Yeah, yeah, I got it. He said, did you read it? I said, no, not yet. I haven't opened it. He says, okay. He said, open it up. He said, read it and then give me a call back. So I opened it up and it looks like my seventh grade English teacher walked through that thing with a red pen. There were literally the stuff that was like blocked out and off to the side, it, it said, no nephew, you're wrong. <laughs> And, and so, and then he would explain. And, and so I looked at it and I called him and we had a couple of conversations. And I said, let me address these things and, and add, add what we talked about here. And can I shoot it back to you? Yeah, sure, no problem. And that happened four or five times before he said, I think you're there. I think you're there. And so I asked him, I said, hey, I don't feel comfortable just being solo author on this. This was pre-tenure. I don't feel comfortable being solo author on this because you've contributed so much. Can I, can I add you as a, as a co-author? And he said, you do what's best for you. He said, I understand that, uh, I understand that pre-tenure, you need to uh, hit a certain number and if, if, if a solo author publication serves you better, he said, do that. And I said, I can't do that. And I said, what works best for me is to, to do this with you because we did it together. I said, sure, no problem. And it happened. In hindsight, I asked myself, what if I hadn't sent it to him? I would, and, and, and it somehow got back to community that I inappropriately shared community-held information, community-held knowledge. Um, it would be, uh, I, would, I, I would have alienated myself from my own community. Uh, would have thrown me into an identity crisis again. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, it, was, it was something that I've learned since then. And now my common practice is to bounce it off of somebody back home, write with indigenous peoples when we're writing about community things, just so that I'm not becoming an extractor of my own community knowledge as a tool of an institution that was developed as a result of manifest destiny. Um, so bicultural accountability has, has, has become a huge, huge uh, focus for me. All right, I'm going to rip through these really fast. It might be a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, but in practice, I use that uh, uh, IEFA constitutional mandate, Indian Education for All, in everything I do. I feel privileged to be able to use that as a result of, of, of state law. Uh, in engineering, uh, a place where this work is rarely, rarely being done. There are a couple of instances where people are considering indigenous perspectives in engineering, but I also want to make sure that I'm thinking about this in terms of community knowledge today. All right, IEFA, there's seven essential understandings. Our project specifically addresses tribal diversity, uh, indigenous identity location, uh, conceptualizations free Columbus, um, we, part of this is uh, related to indigenous perspective differences and uh, differences in understanding tribal sovereignty or applying tribal sovereignty. Okay, so on the left, uh, we, we uh, had, a, had a little project at the College of Engineering. And on the left, if you wanna, if you wanna have a really good time, come out this spring or later in the, or, or in the fall, and we're gonna have our engineers 
um, put up a teepee. So here's the rule, engineers, don't cut my tarp, don't cut my lace pins, don't cut my poles, my stakes, my ropes, nothing. Put your knives and hatchets away. Rule number two, you can't Google or Wikipedia anything because if you're putting one of these up, there's a good, there's a high likelihood that there's no internet access or no cell service. And rule number three is you have one hour. I recognize you engineers as being uh, um, the leaders of your field, your PhDs. There's a lot of academic horsepower there. And this is what our engineers were able to come up with. Right, so they, they took an hour, actually about 50 minutes. They're like, okay, I think we got it. And I said, okay, I said, let's take it down. And then myself and we had Dr. Kinsey Skillen right here from Texas A&M. Turns out I know Kinsey's mom, his family's from back home. Uh, uh, and I asked him, he's Dakota, I'm Nakona. Uh, and, and I asked him, I said, all right, you wanna set up Sue or Assiniboine? And he said, Sue, he said, oh, I said, all right. So that means we face our door a particular way. Um, but the setup, the pole setup, he said, I'm not very, I'm not really sure I, he says I can help. I said, okay, we'll do the framework, Assiniboine, and, and we'll go uh, Dakota direction. And he said, okay, okay. So in about 20 minutes, geez, I'm just proud of this setup too. I wish some of my more relatives were there to see it because I don't, I rarely do it that well. But we were able to get this thing drum tight the way that it's supposed to be set up. Uh, we had a limited amount of space underneath to allow for airflow and the fire. And we talked about the process. I also made this a, a family initiative. I got my sons here, there's one number one, uh, my niece right here, another kid in there somewhere. Oh, there he is. And then like the, the faculty and engineering and their family and dogs, right? So this is a community initiative. So, I asked them to look at it and think of it from an engineer's perspective. And one of them is like, man, this would be a perfect, perfect example to use in class for computational fluid dynamics. And so this is our first iteration, or, or my colleague's first iteration of the fluid dynamics of a Cinnaboyne TP. This is, it shows airflow, it shows temperature, um, et cetera. So as a result, uh, we kept working on this. And we have an undergraduate student uh, taken a little bit further and starting to model what this would look like. And so we wrote a grant and we're in the process of getting the instrumentation to measure airflow, airspeed, uh, carbon dioxide, temperature, outside temperature, uh, et cetera. So this is turning into a hypothesis testing. And this is our instance of indigenous perspectives in engineering education. We don't want to change everything. That's too big of a too big of a call, uh, too big of a call to ask him for us. We want to show one way to do it and then promote that way to do it so that it works across disciplines. Finally, uh, for, for our purposes here, I again have to go back home and bounce this idea off of the knowledge keepers. There's a couple of uncles here. This is uh, Ronnie Jackson. Wolf Point, Montana, this is Mason Runs Through. Uh, Ronnie was one of the guys that helped set up the last buckskin Assiniboine uh, teepee. Uh, Mason Runs Through for the Huday Sana clan since the late 70s, early 80s, has been uh, a resource in the community for setting up the, the clan uh, lodges at, at our gathering. So I bounced it off of them to make sure it was okay. And if, if we could come to them for questions and clarification, and they both said, yeah, yeah, this is, a, this is a good idea. So we have that community connection. Community triangulation, this was the uh, computer stuff that I was talking about earlier. This is the, the teacher looked at this or the PI looked at this and said, who's this guy in the big hat? And then they had their, their computer science folks do up a, a coding version of this, an animation of this. And I was like, geez, if anybody at home saw that, they would make fun of me. And so we had a couple of indigenous scholars that helped uh, uh, develop what they had further, made things a little more realistic. No, it's not perfect. There, there certainly are critiques, but it's a, a step in the process toward responsible uh, 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 production of community work. All right, I'm gonna burn through those takeaways Right. Uh, I hope you're able to reimagine your institution's relationship with indigenous communities. Um, think about the curricular barriers 
that you have and ways to get around them. Um, doing your work in alignment with community interests. Forward practice, right? Forward pragmatic change ask you to, and, and, and to leverage interest convergence. How can you make this important from the perspective of those that have the power to allow you to do it? Okay, uh, Twyla, uh, the student that I worked with, I wanted to check with her to make sure this uh, made sense. And she said, yeah, absolutely makes sense, but they've got to know that this is going to be more work for everybody. That's not something people are interested in. Her uh, her recommendation was to be comfortable with ambiguity, uh, comfortable in, 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 in maybe not knowing, but being open to learning. Um, unlearning structural determinism, you're not bound. Freedom of, uh, uh, freedom of expression leads to academic freedom, which allows us to push back on that structural determinism. Recognizing that there's not one way or a silver bullet. And then reflect on your experience and be critical of systems that you're in and think about why was this uncomfortable. All right, uh, that said, uh, if, if you're interested in more uh, work around this area, my colleague, Dr. Chim San Pedro at The Ohio State University and I uh, do a lot of this work in applying indigenous research methods. Some of the stories here are in this, uh, uh, in this presentation are part of this book. So my last question is why do you do what you do? Uh, thank you, and if you've got any questions, comments, colorful criticism, uh, anything of the like, if you can't get them in during your questions, I'm open to email communication. I'm the only Sweeney, Sweeney Wind Chief around. Uh, I'm pretty easy to find. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Winchief. That was an incredible talk. Uh, we now have just a couple of minutes for uh, some Q&A with our participants. Uh, so if anybody has questions, please feel free to use the hand raise or uh, use the chat feature in Zoom as our staff here in CAT will be facilitating the Q&A session. And I think just to start things off, there was uh, one question that I've seen already. There may be more that I missed as I was listening, um, but uh, uh, Jill asked, and some people have been discussing this in the chat. Uh, she said, I'm caught in a catch-22. I want to understand what constitutes sharing inappropriate cultural knowledge. Okay, um, let's, let's see a, a really good example of that. And, and, and it can be quite complicated, right? So a really good example of that would be, um, I would say if somebody's taking uh, community held, community protected knowledge, and it's really easy to do in scholarship because you don't have real control over, uh, over how that knowledge is used. Or, or like oftentimes people um, are really good at confirmation bias and they'll do alert review looking for only things that support what they already know and believe, right? Um, and, and, and are unable to substantiate necessarily in some cases why that's the case. The best example that I can think of is there were some researchers from here at our institution that were doing work in my home community, non-native researchers doing work in my home community. And they wrote into their grant uh, tobacco, right? To buy tobacco. And for us, there's a, uh, a, there's a, a protocol and a reason that, that you offer tobacco to someone and there's rules around it, right? And I thought, wow, that, that's really insightful. That's impressive that they would go to that level like they're gonna ask somebody for help that they offer them tobacco. And I can imagine that someone shared, right? Um, uh, that if you're gonna ask for help, offer them tobacco without sharing why, right? And so they would offer tobacco and, and not knowing the, the gravity that came with that kind of an act was missed by the researchers, right? And so if, if you're going to share something, uh, you have to trust the person that you're sharing it with to, to do it uh, in, in alignment with community values and social mores. Um, that, that, that's one example, but I, I see a lot of writing, uh, a, a lot of scholarship that I think over discloses uh, 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 indigenous gathering in a ceremonial way. Right. If you if you Google Scholar Sweat Lodge, there's something there that probably everybody can access 
And I think it's inappropriate, right? People do it different ways uh, and they have reasons for doing it the ways that they do, but there are non-natives that are taking this knowledge, setting up sweat lodges. And if you Google sweat lodge, Sedona, Arizona, 2008, there are people that die as a result, right? For somebody, from somebody misappropriating this knowledge. So it's a way to concurrently uh, share some knowledge, but also protect others. Thank you. Um, just a, a, another question from Kathleen Morreale in my office. Uh, in kinship and mentoring, how might students promote that model with their mentors coming at it from the opposite angle? That's a, that's a great question, right? And the important part is that I wasn't able to expand upon is that this is an internal shift for, for the student, right? And, 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 and relationships are not assigned, man. Relationships are uh, developed over time. Right, and we have to we have to make that difference between the academy and 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 our, our community way sometimes. But if you're working with a student and you're in open communication with them, uh, a lot of students will ask me to be on their committee, and I'll have to ask them what role do I play, what specifically do you want from me on your committee, so I can focus on that. And then I ask them what roles the other committee members play. So that I know where I sit in this community construction of uh, uh, of someone's committee. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a comment from Dave Goodrich here uh, and a question. Um, thank you, Dr. Winchief. Uh, I recently heard a colleague criticize land acknowledgement efforts as being offensive and or seen as problematic by indigenous communities, which was news to me. Is that a debate worth having? Do you have a perspective and what do you recommend? Thank you. Oh man, uh, uh, time and place, right? Um, so, so land acknowledgement. I, I, when I first, when I, I first heard them, it was uh, Canadian First Nation scholars, probably 10, 15 years ago, um, and I thought, wow, that's pretty impressive, right? So at first, I was like, these are sweet, um, but then they they began to lose their power and meaning, right? They became a bit cliche. Um, I'm not a big fan. I mean, I like the fact that institutions uh, put thought into developing one, but I think the next step is for people to create their own uh, the same way that one creates a relationship with their knowledge, they can create a relationship with their land acknowledgement, right? There, I, I didn't say, so I'm unfamiliar with tribes largely in the Northeast, and I just, I haven't had a chance to develop relationships to spend any time or contribute to those communities or care. Um, I'm, I was afraid to say names because I don't want to say I'm wrong, right? I could be theoretically sensitive, right? If we're talking posting stamps, I could be theoretically sensitive and, 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 and try to say those names, but it might be dishonoring if I mispronounce those names, right? So I, I would say share what you, what you have in relationship in your own experience and are genuine about, as opposed to a cliche, Sort of reading of another one, not to say that that won't change over time as well, right? So I think right now that would be where where I would encourage folks to develop their own land acknowledgement uh, in concert with the the communities that are of the place. Great, thank you so much. Um, it looks as if the questions are, are trickling off a bit as, as we approach lunch, and I think everybody's already digesting this fantastic talk. Um, I just want to hold this open for just one more second, if that's all right with you, um, Absolutely. just to see if there are any final questions coming in here. All right. Um, it, it does appear that we have one more question here. Um, uh, Jan has asked, uh, I'm considering adding land acknowledgements for a student handbook for our program in an effort to make our handbook more inclusive. Is this an appropriate use of land acknowledgement? Um, I, it's, it's a start. Uh, uh, I, I think that uh, it should come with a caveat, right? That land acknowledgement, um, um, are, are, are developed uh, personally. I think college students are, are, are primed. This generation in particular um, seems like they want to want to do the right thing and shown and be shown how to do it. 
and I think learning comes through engaging in that conversation. So I, I, I do think like um, if you find a land acknowledgement, you could, if there's an institutionally approved land acknowledgement, you could post that and say, this is the institution's land acknowledgement, but what's yours? Thank you. Um, I have a, another question here. Uh, Julie Ashlock would like to know if um, they can quote you on relationships are not designed, relationships are developed over time. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's not mine. That's, <laughs> it's, but it is. So, so I will say that we found in our, our research for our mentoring program, there was one respondent that, and he, he led a, uh, a program uh, on a campus. Uh, specifically for Native students. And he said we, and mentoring was a part of his charge, right? It was part of his grant. And so they did this mentoring pairing program. And the first time they did it, they did it at random, right? Mm -hmm. And he said, he said that, he said, and we did it a couple of times, that works, but it's totally happenstantial, right? He says, he said later after they developed it, when they started, uh, started their, their changed their program because some mentors that were not productive, not helpful. Um, they, they put everybody in a room together so that they could get to know each other a little bit, right? Uh, scholars were able to present a little bit about what's important to them in their work. Students were able to present a little bit about what they were interested in focusing on. And then they let those happen organically as opposed to assigning at random mentors. And I think that was a, a really important take home for people that are developing mentoring programs. Great, thank you so much. Um, I, I just want to reiterate what's coming up over and over again in, in the comments, which is thank you so much uh, for taking this time and sharing this perspective and your experiences with us. Um, this is uh, this concludes our keynote presentation and we're going